On this edition for Saturday, November 10th, wildfires rage in northern and southern California, forcing tens of thousands to flee. The vote count continues across several states where key races are too close to call. And in our signature segment, Milan's musical rest home, where the beat still goes on. Next on PBS NewsHour Weekend. From the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center in New York, Hari Srinivasan. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Three major fires continue to burn out of control in California where firefighters are battling to save homes and lives during high winds and drought conditions. At least nine people have died. Their bodies were found in Butte County, north of Sacramento. It's the location of the Camp Fire, one of the most destructive in the state's history, where close to 7,000 homes and businesses have burned. The fire almost completely wiped out the town of Paradise, and hundreds of thousands of residents in the area have fled. About 500 miles south, near Los Angeles, the Woolsey and Hill fires have burned more than 70,000 acres and forced at least a quarter of a million people to evacuate. Last night, a fire department helicopter captured the massive Woolsey fire as it advanced over the ridgeline above Malibu and towards the Pacific Coast Highway. Sharon McNary is a reporter at Southern California Public Radio, joins me now via Skype from Oak Park, California. Sharon, tell me, what, you, what have you been reporting on this morning? What have you seen so far today? I have seen just a lot of destruction, a lot of areas being burned out. Uh, there's a very famous park, Malibu Creek State Park, burned over, its visitor center is lost. Um, the freeway, the 101, a main artery for getting around Los Angeles, that was burned over. You can actually see the burned timbers. I've been to a number of burned out houses. And I mean, I'm sitting in front of one right now in Oak Park. Just the smell of it. It's just like this combination of like melted chemicals and plastic and wood and stucco. Um, and then just the general vibe of people being evacuated and some staying behind. Um, just there's a procession of people driving up and down the street just to look at the burned out houses. Um, you know, it's kind of a combination of good neighbor, can I help, and just looky loo. So, yeah. Sharon, also, I want to ask about the mask that you've got on right now. What is the air quality like as you travel through these places? Well, where I am right now, this is one of the earliest places that burned early Friday morning. So, the air quality here is pretty good, but down in uh, Calabasas, closer to Malibu, you need this mask because you get particles in your lungs. And if you breathe it long enough, it just feel like you're trying to breathe a sponge. And you're just off the road from the area that was having a vigil last night to grieve for those people that were the victims of the mass murder earlier this week. And what happened there? Um, it, it's kind of a double whammy for this community. The Family Reunification Center for that incident turned into an evacuation center for the fire that followed. So you had people that were grieving combined with people who were evacuees. There are people who have been affected by the shooting who have also been evacuated from their homes. Absolutely. And put this in some geographic perspective for people who aren't familiar with Los Angeles or Malibu or Calabasas. This is just sort of just a few miles up the road from those sort of famous beaches and lifeguard shacks we're all used to seeing. So the 101 freeway connects greater Los Angeles to Ventura, and along that way are all these, you know, very nice communities. And it's that that's burning. It's out the 101, maybe about 40 miles outside of Los Angeles, and um, into the sea, which is Malibu. So this fire has gone from the freeway, the 101, about 30, 40 miles to the ocean. And it's just burned a whole ton of houses close to the ocean. Finally, I want to ask, you know, the president tweeted this morning that uh, he was basically putting the blame on a lot of this on poor forest management. What's the response been from uh, California leadership on this? I can imagine they will request the president do some actual research on the kind of forest management that California has done. Um, the area that's burned is not particularly foresty. It's brush. It's classic brush fire territory. If there's a vulnerability here, it's the people who live in this area who've built in the wildland urban interface and not the forest and its management itself. All right. Sharon McNary, reporter of Southern California Public Radio, joining us via Skype. Thanks so much. Thanks for your interest.
Too close to call in a politically divided America, the results of the midterm elections are, not surprisingly, very, very close. And in several states, the vote count is not complete. In Florida today, the Secretary of State ordered machine recounts in three races, including for U.S. Senate and governor. For more on what's next there and in key races in Georgia and Arizona, we turn now to Miles Parks, a reporter for NPR's Washington desk, who's covering the vote counts and possible recounts, along with charges and countercharges about possible fraud. He joins us now from Washington, D.C. Miles, here we are several days after the election, and the election is continuing in, in state after state. Uh, Georgia, let's start there. Yeah, absolutely, Hari. So Georgia is a really interesting case where we've got two candidates kind of living in two separate universes. You've got Republican Brian Kemp, who was Secretary of State. Uh, he has resigned his post as Secretary of State and has basically begun a celebration tour, uh, talking as if he has won this election, whereas Democrat Stacey Abrams has not yet conceded. The Associated Press has yet to call this race, and votes are still coming in. Basically, Brian Kemp is saying that the vote margin is, is much too large to possibly trigger this automatic recount or an automatic runoff election, whereas the Abrams campaign is saying provisional ballots are still being counted, some absentee ballots in some parts of the states are still coming in, and they want to wait for all the votes to come in before they concede. They're even saying that they're uh, already buying TV ads uh, in preparation for a runoff election, even though that seems uh, a little premature at this point. How far away from that threshold is the vote count in Georgia? At this point, uh, it was about 63,000. Brian Kemp's lead on Stacey Abrams was about 63,000. But that doesn't, Stacey Abrams doesn't need to, to make up that and take up the lead. All she needs to do, what her campaign says, is about net about 26,000 votes would put it into uh, the place where a recount uh, would be triggered and 24,000, excuse me, 26,000 votes would, would uh, trigger a runoff election, whereas 24,000 votes netting 24,000 votes would trigger a recount. All right, now let's talk about Arizona, a hotly contested race there. Yeah, absolutely. And this is a place that hundreds of thousands of votes still have yet to be counted. But Democrat Kirsten Sinema has taken over a slight lead over Republican Martha McSally. Uh, what's really interesting here is you're not seeing uh, this contest turn into a super partisan battle yet. Uh, the Republican, the, the governor who was just elected uh, on Tuesday came out with a statement and said, basically, we want to let this process uh, continue. We want democracy to work as it should. We want all the votes to be counted before we name a winner. And there's been no talk of funny business on either side. They're just letting these votes come in. A lot of votes in Arizona are vote by mail ballots, so they take a lot longer to count uh, mm -hmm. than traditional day of voting. All right. And finally, Florida. Uh, multiple races. Uh, this is almost a a flashback to 2000, recount, recount, lawyers, countersuits. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we're seeing three statewide races at this point uh, going to a recount, which is really interesting. This is the first statewide recount for statewide office in the Florida's, Florida's history. Uh, you've got the commissioner of agriculture, with, which uh, no one is talking about at this point, headed to a recount. And then the two races that we've been following closely really for much of this year, uh, the governor's race between Democrat Andrew Gillum and Republican uh, Ron DeSantis has now crossed the threshold under this half a percentage point margin that would trigger an automatic recount. And then the Senate race is even closer than that. It, right now, Democrat Bill Nelson trails Republican Rick Scott by less than a quarter of a percentage point, which would not only uh, trigger an automatic machine recount, but if you, in Florida, by Florida state law, if you're under that quarter percentage point, it also triggers a mandatory hand count for some of the ballots. Wow. All right. Miles Parks of NPR, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Hari. Tomorrow is the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I, and leaders of dozens of countries are in France this weekend to honor those who died. Today, President Trump met with French President Emmanuel Macron in Paris. Trump sparked tensions at the beginning of his trip by tweeting criticism of Macron for calling for a European army, writing, quote, perhaps Europe should first pay its fair share of NATO. In a joint press conference, Macron said he was proposing increased European defense spending in alignment with Trump's wishes for greater European participation in NATO. Mr. Trump was scheduled to visit the Ain Marne American Cemetery today, where U.S. troops are buried but had to cancel due to bad weather. A U.S. delegation, including Chief of Staff John Kelly, attended. The president is scheduled to attend a dinner tonight and an Armistice Day ceremony at the Arc de Triomphe on Sunday morning before returning to the U.S. tomorrow night. 
Thousands of Central American migrants left Mexico City early this morning. The members of a weeks-long caravan walk used specially designated metro trains to get to the northern part of the city. The migrants will need to travel 600 more miles to the nearest U.S. border crossing in McAllen, Texas. Yesterday, President Trump issued a proclamation that went into effect today, denying asylum claims by anyone not entering through official ports of entry on the Mexican border. Migrants who enter the country illegally through other parts of the border risk immediate deportation and will be denied asylum rights. The ACLU has filed suit in federal court to block the presidential proclamation. From Democrats eyeing Trump's tax returns to Republican allies of the president, read about 10 key lawmakers in the new Congress on our website at pbs.org slash newshour. In the lead-up to the election, PBS NewsHour Weekend's Yvette Feliciano visited the state of Florida, where one of the key issues on the ballot was not over leadership in the state, but whether or not some 1.5 million people with prior felonies would be given the right to vote. People like Neil Volz, a member of the Florida Rights Restoration Coalition, who lobbied to have their voting rights restored. We come from a place of understanding these issues personally. Neil Volz, the group's political director, is a former Republican congressional staffer and lobbyist. In 2006, he pleaded guilty in a congressional bribery case and received a felony conviction for conspiracy. We fight the good fight on behalf of the million plus family members and friends and directly impacted people in the state of Florida who know firsthand uh, what it's like to walk around with a felony conviction and try and get a job or try and get housing or any of the collateral consequences that ultimately come along with a, a sentence like that. What would it mean to have your voting rights restored? I mean, for me, it would be the ability to be a full citizen in my community. That initiative, which was Amendment 4, passed overwhelmingly on Election Day. Mirna Perez is Deputy Director of the Brennan Center's Democracy Program at NYU and leader of the Center's Voting Rights and Elections Project. She joins me here in the studio. Let's, let's talk a little bit about what happened in the midterms. We've had a few days to digest this. It kind of seems like it's, depending on who you are, you think about increasing access or you think about voter suppression, right? Depends on uh, how you talk about it. So um, let's talk in a couple of different categories. First, North Carolina and Arkansas uh, approved voter ID requirements. What does that mean? North Carolina and Arkansas are two states where the political forces in those states have for years, for years, have been trying to push really, really regressive and restrictive photo ID laws. And while those two laws passed, I'm heartened by a couple of things. One, in both of those states, the numbers that passed were well below 88 to 92 percent, which to me means that Americans who would be unaffected by these laws, Americans who have this kind of identification, still voted on behalf of their neighbors and their citizens who don't. Mm -hmm. Also, both of those laws allow for opportunities to lobby the legislature to make sure that the legislature enacts um, ID requirements, exemption requirements, and other policies that may blunt the law. Yeah, let's talk also about the, the ripple effects of what happened in Florida. I mean, this was an enormous state, uh, a huge population with prior criminal families. Is there a possibility that other states are going to model themselves after this? So now we only have Kentucky and Iowa. If you want to count Virginia because Virginia's constitution allows for permanent disenfranchisement, you can. But right now, Iowa and Kentucky are the only states remaining that say it doesn't matter what you did. It doesn't matter how long ago it was when you did it. It doesn't matter how old you were. If you have a felony conviction, you lose your right to vote forever, unless the government specifically decides to pardon you. And I think what Florida demonstrates is that we are a country that believes in not writing people off. If someone is living and working amongst us and has uh, obligations and responsibilities, they should also have the ability to decide the direction that our country is going. And it's been super, super exciting to see people from all walks of life come together and vote for Florida's amendment. And I very much believe that the people in Iowa and Kentucky um, share the same sentiment. Let's talk about a couple of other states, uh, Nevada and Michigan, 
automatic voter registration. How significant is that? What does it do? It's very exciting. Automatic voter registration means that when somebody is attempting to register to vote, the presumption is that if they're eligible, they're going to be registered to vote. So, so you have to opt out. You have to opt out. That's exactly right. And also that the information is going to be electronically transferred to the election office rather than having to mess with pieces of paper that then someone has to go in and enter. It's a really exciting measure because it's got something for everybody. If you're someone that wants access and wants more people participating, well, it's opt out, right? You're going to be registered unless you say that you don't. If you're a person that wants your government to work more efficiently, you're mm. not going to be messing with all these pins and papers and data entry. If you're someone that wants the roles to be cleaner, then the fact that it's a computer transferring information in one place to another place and not someone that has to decipher someone's chicken scratch on a voter registration form, you're going to get cleaner roles. All right. Mirna Perez of the Brennan Center. Thanks so much. Thank you. It's said that old soldiers never die, they just fade away. But what about old musicians? If they're lucky, they just keep on playing. That's in fact what's happening in Milan, Italy, at a retirement home built especially for musicians. NewsHour Weekend special correspondent Chris Livesay has our story from a place where the music never stops. Meet Raimondo Campisi, a renowned pianist who spent his life performing around the globe. At 70 years old, he's not playing inside a traditional concert hall. This is Casa Verdi, a retirement home for musicians in Milan, Italy. Its founder was none other than the 19th century Italian composer Giuseppe Verdi. Blockbuster compositions such as La Traviata, Rigoletto, and Otello helped him amass a fortune he would use to build the neo-Gothic mansion from the ground up, just before he died in 1901. His royalties would keep the lights on for decades more, providing food, lodging, and medical treatment for musicians who, as Verdi put it, were not favored by fortune, or who, when they were young, did not possess the virtue of saving. All I do is play piano and spend money. Thieves don't waste their time with me because they won't find any money. Verdi had people like me in mind when he founded Casa Verdi. A pianist like her son, Campisi's mother was also a resident. She passed away three years ago. When my mother lived here, I didn't know the place very well because I was always passing through. And I didn't know how great it was with all these concerts and musicians. Verdi called this retirement home the finest of his life's work. And walking through these halls, you start to understand why. It's impossible to go anywhere without hearing the sound of music. You also see musical references in every corner. In one room, Verdi's own piano. Door handles are modeled after lyres, and keyboard-inspired arches look like they could play a song. Every aesthetic detail Taylor made for a houseful of musicians, and painstakingly designed by Verdi. The maestro himself is here too. He's entombed in the courtyard. <laughs> Today, there are roughly 60 residents. <laughs> Unlike in Verdi's day, they receive state pensions and pay rent on a sliding scale, according to their means. The retirement home welcomes people of all nationalities and backgrounds. There's only one requirement. They must have been professional musicians. Successful applicants have access to ongoing concerts, music rooms, 15 pianos, harps, gramophones, and, perhaps most important, the company of their peers. I have a good life because I have a lot of friends. My young people, old people, they are my friends, I love them. I think that they love me, I think so. B.C. Roman, now 93, says music literally kept her alive in Romania during World War II. Your town was occupied by the Nazis. By the Nazis. And nevertheless, you were still able to play exactly. piano? Exactly. One of them came to us and said to my mother, may I bring you some a little sugar, a little coffee, a little rider, because your, your daughter plays so wonderful. We are all emo emotionally moved. I, we had something to eat through my music. 
After the war, Rahman went on to teach piano and vocal performance around the world, including for 12 years at New York University. And she's still surrounded by young musicians. Since 1993, the retirement home has also rented rooms to music students. The elderly get companionship, and the students say they get free lessons on music and life. <laughs> it's amazing that we can do music with them. We can sing with the old people. In a you're moment, walking you, yes, yes, you're you walking. Uh, do you want to sing? Do oh, you want to play? Together. Yes, 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 yeah. together. Yes, yes, it's fine. But you know that song, yeah. <laughs> Casaverdi's existence hasn't always been guaranteed. Royalties from Verdi's 27 operas kept the home afloat until the 1950s. Then his music entered the public domain, becoming free to everyone. That left Casaverdi without vital funding, says Roberto Rozzi, the president of the Verdi Foundation. Fortunately, the administrators of the house invested this money, especially in apartments and buildings. So now we have more than 100 apartments that we rent to the people, and with the rentals, we finance the house. Rozzi also credits major financial contributions over the decades from titans of classical music, such as Luciano Pavarotti and the heirs of Arturo Toscanini. It is really a miracle that uh, Casaverdi is still open and works very well, without any big problem especially from the financial point of view. To date, Casaverdi has hosted more than 1,500 residents and always has a waiting list. What's your favorite thing about living here? I feel protected. I feel that I am home with people like me who gave the life to the music. is PBS NewsHour Weekend, Saturday. Turkey shared audio recordings related to the killing of journalist Jamal Khashoggi with leaders in Saudi Arabia, the U.S., and European countries. That's according to comments made today by Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Khashoggi was a vocal critic of the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. After initially denying any involvement, the Saudi government admitted Khashoggi was killed in a premeditated operation. Erdogan did not give details of the nature of the tapes, but said Saudi Arabia, the U.S., Germany, Britain, and France have all heard the recordings. Sri Lanka's president dissolved the country's parliament last night and called for new elections. President Maithripala Sirisena attempted to replace the current prime minister in late October, but he still has not left office. The current parliament refused to recognize the new prime minister. Sri Lanka's Supreme Court is expected to rule on the constitutionality of President Sirisena's actions in the coming weeks. The Democratic Republic of Congo is now facing the worst Ebola outbreak in its history. Last night, the country's health minister said an estimated 198 people have died since August, and there are now 319 confirmed and probable cases. Response efforts have been complicated by the current conflict in Congo, where aid workers have been threatened and attacked by militants. UN peacekeepers say they will increase efforts to protect aid workers. The health minister noted that despite the grim figures, more than 27,000 people have been vaccinated against Ebola. The death toll from a suicide bombing at a hotel in Somalia is now more than 50 people, including seven terrorists. The attackers stormed the building after detonating multiple car bombs near the hotel's protective wall. Al-Shabaab, the Islamic extremist rebel group, claimed responsibility for yesterday's attack. More than 100 people were wounded. Tomorrow night, could a new Florida development become a model for sustainability? That's all for this edition of PBS NewsHour Weekend. I'm Hari Srinivasan. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.